Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chapter 3. This is Lead Generation here in email marketing. Today, we're going to look at a couple of slides looking at the process of lead generation, looking at the sales funnel, the email funnel, and really how email marketing can help to push lead generation efforts. Um, you know, I'm not a huge fan of text-heavy slides, but in an effort to follow the chapter um, and the the readings here, specifically in this lead generation piece, I will try to stick with them. So we're going to start here with a quick overview of the funnel. Um, at a high level, the sales funnel that we'll look at in business is broken into three parts. There's the top of the funnel, which is more of a, a marketing centric piece where the prospects learn more about the business. The middle of the funnel, which is more of a you know center um kind of like pushing people through to eventually get them to buy the product where there's more of a kind of like that creation of demand and then there is the bottom of the funnel and that is really where you go for the close and in sales uh marketing really helps with with all of these in one uh in one area or another but if you look at it you know, the, that the funnel from a marketing perspective, when we think about the ability to communicate and, and essentially, you know, create that demand and, and generate that demand, we are going to kind of break down each, each layer here as an introduction to where email marketing can fit. When I look at the top of the funnel, specifically, I'm looking at a couple sec, couple ideas such as, um, well, that will lead to people learning about the brand possibly for the first time. That's where you see things like, as listed here, uh, promotional efforts, incentives, um, inviting invites to a free webinar, um, advertising. It's the area where you need to to hook them for the first time, and it's not something that is always considered to be super successful, you know, you're gonna have a low success rate as a marketer. Um, but it's the thing that will at least capture somebody's attention so that you can provide that, that first push. You essentially turn them into a lead. The middle of the funnel, this is where you take those leads and you begin to, I mean, the, the screen says nurture, but I look at it more from the perspective of uh, developing the brand's uh, expertise, developing trust, and making it where the individual is actually going to consider becoming a, a customer. Some people in the top of the funnel, you know, they'll they'll just kind of go through the efforts because they want the the free stuff, they want the incentives, they want the education that comes through a webinar. And they have no plans. They have no. Um, you know, there's no. There's no um, idea here that they're going to eventually become a customer. However, the middle of the funnel does exist for that very reason. That is where uh, they can uh, really become more familiar with what it is that you're doing and start to understand and think, okay, maybe I do want to do business with these people. And that's where you have you know, email back and forth, the one-on-one -on -one, um, discussions, the calls and and it, this says hosting webinars, but I look at this as more of, of the opportunity for the business to show what it is that they do and how they can provide value to the lead. Because then you get into that third set, stage here. This is the bottom of the funnel. And this is where the, the hard sell comes through. This is where you have the actual sales call. This is where, hey, you, you know, you can sign up with us. We have a promotion going through the end of the week. Things like that where the salespeople do their thing and they can get the business. So, you know, what does that mean for email? The email marketing funnel is really a big part of that, of, of all of that, all three stages. If you think about it, I mean, I look at a funnel a little bit differently um, as the one whose background is in content marketing and and you know, that's kind of my thing. I look at the funnel in four stages. 
But email marketing is still a pivotal piece in a lot of that. And, and, you know, for one, it's easy to communicate, maybe not in a one-on-one, one-to-one setting, but it's easy to see and, and analyze what it is that your leads are doing with the brand. You can see, you know, with emails, okay, did they open an email? Did they click an email? What did they look at on our website? You know, maybe there's a button in your email that says, take advantage of this special promotion that expires at the end of the week. If they click on that, then, you know, you'll see in your, um, in your email marketing software that they did. And then you'll also see, you know, when that happened and, and, you know, how long were they there on the page? What did they do? What actions did they take from there? That way, you know, okay, there's at least an initial interest there. There's something there. There's an opportunity. And I really think this is where the idea of analytics comes in where you can use analytics to really hone in on who those warm leads are. And they call this the lead flow here um, because, you know, leads have to flow through the email marketing funnel in order for everything to be successful. This doesn't apply to every single business, not, not every single type of business, but when email marketing is used for lead generation, it's really a critical component here. Um, you know, lead gen in a, in the most you know, in the most simple um, terms possible right now in the 2020s is that people sign up for an email, they subscribe to your email list, they go through a couple of stages, they get some emails, they respond, they begin to trust the brand, they get a sales call, they learn a little bit more, they finally have a demand for it, and then they become a customer. However, um, that's just me spitballing. In reality, there are a lot of different elements that can go into that. You know, I just kind of break it down for you in in the matter of one sentence. Um, There's a lot of different things that happen throughout that process. So, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on every single slide here, but there are customer profiles here that you want to think about. Um, as well as buyer personas. Um, So these are different, by the way. The ideal customer profile is the person that would buy your product, the number one or service, the number one person in this uh, perfect world. This is who the individual is. There's really only one of these people. And a lot of times in the B2B world, it's a company. It's a company that that has $10 million in revenue who works in a certain niche and who does all these other specific things, right? They have a need for, maybe they're missing, maybe they need more marketing people, maybe they need something else. You know, there's, there are lists of needs that the company has where your business can fit perfectly. On the other hand, you have the buyer persona. There can be several of these. I usually build three to five buyer personas because there are different types of individuals. Um, Also, buyer personas can be broken down into an individual person. An ideal customer profile is exactly that. It's an ideal. It's someone who really doesn't doesn't officially exist, but it's also somebody that it's not a real person. It's it's more of a it's a set of targets that combine to make the ideal person or company. The buyer persona people give them names. There's buyer personas are like, okay, here's Jim, the um, the marketing director at XYZ company. And Jim drives this car. Jim works from home two days a week. Like it, you can go into some really big detail here where you can learn about their latent motivations and really what it is that makes them tick that will eventually get them to become a customer. And obviously, obviously the more you know about your ideal customer, the more your the better your chances are at locking them in and getting them to eventually buy. Um, you know, that, that's really a key difference here because when we look at the ideal customer profiles, you know, it says it can be highly detailed or generalized. I usually see them pretty generalized. Um, yes, there are a certain level of details. I look at it kind of like a bulleted list. There's like four to six points. Um, and most ideal customer profiles are businesses. Um, but also you want to think about, you know, what are their limitations? What are, um, what are they actually in the market for? What are the things that they search for? And again, it's very rare that you encounter 
the person or business that has every single one of these um, elements. The buyer personas, on the other hand, are a little bit more uh, realistic. Um, so lead qualification here, I mean, this is when you look at a lead that comes through and you see, okay, how closely do they fit uh, to the ideal customer profile? And also, you know, do they are they fitting in one of the buyer personas? Um, you know, email marketing, off, most email marketing programs at this point have a lead qualification process. Like it's all automated. You can work through it where, you know, somebody signs up for your email list and they provide all of the pertinent information. Um, a lot of times from a business side, that means like, uh, you know, joining an email list often comes with downloading an ebook or some other sort of incentive, right? You say, Hey, I, uh, download this thing for, you know, 50 ideas for generative AI prompts or something. And you got to put in your name, your email, um, your industry, your company, what your uh, job role is, how many, what the revenue of the company is, how many people are at the company, all of these different fields. And it's not because they just, you know, want to make sure that you earn your ebook. Um, they're going to qualify you as a lead. They want to be able to, to tell, okay, is this person worth our time? And sometimes, you know, they can even figure out what, what is the buying intent here? Um, from what I've seen in my own personal experience, I'll go through, you know, I've filled out a ton of those forms in the past. Um, I rarely fit the ideal customer profile. Sometimes I do. And it's interesting because um, even if you don't, you're going to get emails. You're still in the email flow. You're still in the email campaign because you never know if that person could eventually be a customer. Um, I'm not going to talk about data scraping here. It, this is I want to talk more about the process you know, just as an overarching statement here. Um, just look at the last point. Um, it is where you're actually you know, using this software, using email marketing software, using these other programs um, to figure out more information about that middle of the funnel here in the center so that you can do more with the data. You can do more with these individuals, learn more about them. And essentially, you know, using the internet to do your research on individuals. Um, not something we're going to go into too much here. Um, that's also where web scraping comes in, you know, we'll use it in LinkedIn to, to learn a little bit about a, uh, a lead, for example. That's a very popular one today, especially if you are active on LinkedIn. Um, the direct message function on LinkedIn has essentially kind of replaced email marketing in some in in one weird sense, um, where people just send you several messages. But again, that's not for today. Um, and with here, this is more about ethical scraping practices. You know, what can you do and actually use? And we're not going to dig into that here. You know, I I just wanted to. Um, kind of move forward to not even this slide, but the next one, you know, again, lead generation and um, data scraping, all of this is, is very, very dependent on, I wouldn't call it AI at this point, um, but automated processes that happen in the back end with your email marketing software. Think about something like MailChimp, even there's tons of processes that people can use in the background. They all cost a little bit of money. Of course, it's not available in the free version, but you can set up a lead, uh, a landing page through MailChimp and a form, have people fill them out to subscribe, send them through a lengthy email funnel, depending on all of these different demographic pieces and the data scraping that comes with it to figure out who your ideal lead is so that you know who you should be spending your time contacting outside of the email uh, lead generation process. But let's talk about lead sources for a second. Shifting gears, the last couple of slides here, we're looking at um, the idea of, okay, where do leads come from? And we think about the number one places are, is the website. If you look at Google Analytics and you see, okay, I got a couple hundred visits, a couple hundred people that visited my website this month. Are they potential customers? Are they just browsing? What are they there for? And you can really tell based on how your web, if your web, your website is um, really optimized for lead generation. That means having the proper subscription forms, the right calls to action, the right sales messaging. Um, and you know, if you have blogs, again, this overlaps with content marketing a little bit. Where you know, content marketing is great, 
Um, but if you want to use that content to lead the business, you, there needs to be something on that web page that moves people from the initial content, um, you know, consuming the content forward to the lead generation part. Hey, you liked what we, you know, you like this list, uh, subscribe here and you'll get an email with another list or something like that. It's really basic. And when I think about this too, this is where SEO comes in the, into the, into the equation, because if people, if you if think about it, if you've never done any advertising or any outward promotion of your website, and yet you're getting hundreds of visits per month and they're not from you or any, you know, not, you know, your close friends, where are they coming from? Most likely they're coming from SEO. People are finding you on Google and whether that this is intentional or not, you know, you're getting traffic um, to your website. So that's where you need to optimize your search engine, op your, optimize your, your, um, you know, your, your search results, where it is at your pages, um, up here, making sure that the people that land on your website are landing on your website for the purposes that you want them for. There's nothing worse than having somebody on your website who is looking for something completely different. Um, well, I guess it's not as bad as nobody going to your website, but you know, if you want people to be on your website and ready to buy, ready to at least fill out that lead generation form, you know, you want to make sure that people are landing there because they searched for the right thing. And generally people that land on your website are, but there are situations where maybe you're not well positioned to gather new clients because say, you know, the most, the most, um, the, the easiest example that I look at is the idea of, um, different sizes of business. If we look at a B2B example, there could be a company that I guess we could use my company as, as an example. I do, um, uh, training and education for digital marketing, similar to what this video is here. From a B2B standpoint, it's a pretty expensive endeavor and requires a professional development budget, requires um, some forethought, more of a strategy, an employee development strategy. It's something that is not for the really small businesses out there. However, most of my traffic and, you know, I, I'm creating this 101, 102 level digital marketing education content on my website. Most of the traffic are entrepreneurs, people that don't have much money or these startup businesses that have no professional development budget, but they're interested in what I have to say. Um, sure, the desires are the same, but the uh, ability to follow through and, be, you know, for me being the vendor here, being being the one looking at clients. I probably wouldn't qualify a lot of the people that actually landed on my website as legitimate leads because I know that they're not going to be able to afford the services. Uh, they don't have the infrastructure as a business to move forward. So that's really the, the you know the difference when we look at lead sources on a, on a website. Uh, LinkedIn, on the other hand, is a little bit different. That is where um, you can be a lot more targeted in the outreach that you do as someone looking for to make some sales. And when I think about that, my big thing is, you know, they talk about sales navigator here on this slide. I'm not a huge proponent of sales navigator. However, it is good to see a lot of details about the companies that are out there, about the individuals, what their histories are. So, you know, all of that data up front, and then you would do the outreach, not quite as impactful as it being the reverse where people go to your website and, you know, that inbound strategy. Um, but it's still a, you know, it's still a resource that you have. And, and that, honestly, that actually that second bullet point's already outdated. Uh, LinkedIn is is approaching a billion users, and with that number comes a, a target for everybody. Every company has somebody in their target audience on LinkedIn using it on a semi regular basis that they can communicate with. The key is figuring out how to do that. That is not what this class is. That's not what this, these slides are, but it can help in driving um, more leads. Another one, affiliate marketing, referral marketing. These are, um, this is like the third party being able to sell, like 
thing about Amazon, say you have a bunch of links that go to Amazon and you're part of the referral program. If somebody clicks on a link from your website to Amazon, buys the product, you get a commission. Lots of affiliate websites out there. The largest one, I think, to this day remains a nerd wallet. Um, they have a ton of affiliate, great affiliate content, but it's it truly provides value. But people go to nerd wallet, they're like, oh, this is in, there's like the top 10 credit cards with the best benefits, best uh, perks. And they, but they're all affiliates. So Nerd Wallet will get a kickback and a commission from all those click throughs. Um, again, a great source of leads. Um, because when you think about it, you are generating those leads either if you're if you're getting it for your business or or for the other one. Um, it's just a great way to earn money. I mean, I think of affiliate marketing as if you can do it successfully, you're making money by helping other businesses drive sales. And you know, you're know, you looking at business conversions here, which ultimately means sales uh, more than anything. Um, now we have uh, the essential, <laughs> the process of, of outbound prospecting. Uh, I, we're not going to go too much into this, but um, it's getting the personal data of prospects through various lists. Um, uh, there's a lot of email lists that are being sold. And it is not something that is recommended today. Um, if you have taken any sort of intro to digital marketing course, you know that that is not really a good way. Um, but there are legal and, and ethical ways that you can do it. I'm, I don't really want to go into that. Um, just know that the, it's something where you can get a lot of information about a lot of people really quickly. It's the internet. Everybody's data is out there. Um, I, I believe the textbook goes into a little bit more detail about how this works and how it can, how it can be worked legitimately. I, I don't really want to touch this, um, this topic here today. Uh, but yeah, the last slide here is how do you manage these leads? Once you have them, what do you do? We are not talking about just sending emails here. We're talking about actual leads. What do you do with them? This is where email marketing sales and just the rest of like the marketing strategy in general needs to consider the leads that are in the system and figure out how to move forward with them and try to close them. And when we look at this list here on the slide, they really talk about the three pieces of one, making sure that your data is clean. That means that making sure that the emails are correct, making sure that the information is accurate. And if somebody just says no, and they they clearly are not interested. Like, don't take them out, move them out, um, mark them as unsubscribed, mark them as inactive, archive them, whatever it is that your system does. Um, second is making sure that um, leads are qualified throughout the entire funnel. We talk about uh, qualifying leads at the beginning when somebody fills out a form and they ha there's all this criteria. But when I look at this, like what happens after that, they get another email and they do, let's say they did, for example, maybe I filled out a form and I got disqualified as a lead where, you know, I said that my company size was one to 10 people when in reality it was 11 to 50, but for whatever reason, I, you know, selected one to 10 accidentally. Maybe I got disqualified. I, I'm still going to get emails, right? Email marketing, um, should be set up where even the people that do not fit that ideal customer profile are getting communications. But maybe I just got an email and I clicked on the button that said there's a sale that goes through next Friday and you can learn more details here. All right. That's a new qualification method. That person is now qualified and is suddenly interested. Maybe they, maybe that is somebody to close. It's important that there's a requalification opportunity that comes throughout the email marketing process. And then finally, we have the, the communication ability, and that is the outreach. Um, at some point, especially for in the B2B world, right, there needs to be a one-to-one -one communication. If your business is selling a $10,000 solution, that's not something a person's going to go on and buy with a credit card today. That's something that is going to require a couple more touch points, some relationship building, some one-on-one -on -one contact, not just email, but phone and probably in person. And that is what that last point is all about, is making sure that the leads are available for 
the, the assigned salesperson or for the marketing team or for whoever it is that is trying to move this person through the funnel, whoever is trying to build thought leadership, build a rapport with this individual so that it can, it can eventually lead to sales. Um, lead management is something that can be very, that used to be very cagey with companies. There's movies out there that are all about, Oh, these leads are so valuable. And I think of that now as being pretty outdated where it's all in a central spot. It's in a CRM customer relationship management program where, yeah, they might have an assigned salesperson, but they should still be receiving the emails. There's still a marketing process an email drip campaign that might be happening. And eventually an opportunity to close them for the assigned sales individual. I always think of a CRM as what Microsoft dynamics is where it's very robust. It's connected to all sorts of different programs. And the central goal is to convert leads into business. Because when we look at email marketing and we look at, um, look at it in a business sense, it's not about lead generation. It's about moving leads through the funnel from that top of the funnel all the way to the bottom and taking somebody who without email marketing would probably just take, wouldn't give it a second look. And, but being able to take that individual and turn them into a paying customer. That's, that's the idea. That's the the moral of the story here. And I hope uh, this was cleared up a little bit for you, but uh, yeah, that's chapter three on lead generation here in email marketing.